yeah, I'll just cover some of the infrastructure software. Uh, so if you just go to the next slide. Yeah, so uh, as I was talking, I think I already covered this. Uh, so hopefully you uh, you got a feel for uh, POSIX compliancy. I think I gave you an introduction of what POSIX actually is. It's about exposing uh, data as hierarchical files, which is uh, most typical in HPC uh, systems today. If you go to the next slide. So yeah, this is where I think uh, you probably may not have heard. Uh, so POSIX compliancy. So POSIX is an IEEE standard for porting applications across different operating systems. So for POSIX, so POSIX IO is part of POSIX and uh, it's a way of uh, accessing data to POSIX IO semantics through read and write and open and close. So there are some very strict constraints with POSIX. For example, you have to have open system call before read and write and uh, and open has its overheads. And if, especially when you have millions of processes wanting to read and write, it's it's an absolute overkill. And there's also uh, with POSIX, we have seen that this very prescriptive and inflexible metadata because you're constrained by what your infrastructure of, of, uh, provides you. Like all files in a directory, for example, have the same metadata and it's not easy to provide additional metadata data descriptors in POSIX. And you have also one of the problems we see as you go towards exascale uh, is uh, co consistency. For example, read always returns the latest write. So which means that read is required to block until it's fully committed. And you can imagine what happens if you if you throw more and more and more number of processes trying to share uh, share a pool of data. So it's going to start to create extreme performance penalties. So some of the, so what the community, uh, we started thinking about how to avoid some of these problems within HPC. And one possible solution that emerged was, okay, let's look at this so-called object stores. Uh, so next slide. So what is object stores? So it's just, uh, you, you looked at POSIX and uh, organization of data as files and directories. So objects is just, uh, organization of data as objects, so-called objects. So uh, objects are just unstructured blobs of data. So it doesn't have any structure. You can just, it's its in a very flat hierarchy. You can individually address each of these objects. And for objects, the beauty is you can have any kind of user-defined metadata and you can overlay any kind of structure on top of these objects. It can be like, uh, it can you can also overlay POSIX uh, semantics, or you can have uh, different kind of file formats on top of objects. You can have these multiple views and relax uh, consistency can be relaxed and tunable. Uh, and uh, for for metadata, you can use so-called key value stores, so where you describe your own metadata as as per your desire. And these key value stores can be in very high performing uh, tiers, uh, so it can be very fast. So, so next slide. So, uh, uh, so speaking about data formats, uh, so just a quick introduction to what you what what you'll hear a lot in HPC is uh, this uh, so-called uh, um, hierarchical data format HDF5 and NetCDF, which is used in uh, a lot in the weather and climate community. So these data formats are just designed to like store and manage la very very large amounts of data. So when you say HDF5, it's a data model as well as a file format. So if you take a if you take a HDF5 file for if you're looking at your scientific application, the first thing that comes to mind is how you actually group all these uh, how you group all these data sets and how you put all these uh, uh, you have these various values and various uh, vectors and matrices. So, for example, just to give you an example, you have, uh, if, if you look at, say, uh, some weather and climate, you have altitude on one direction and time in the other, and uh, you can take some data points for all these different altitudes and for those different times. Uh, so, you all group them in certain ways. So, that's that's when you have these so-called uh, HDF5 formats. And NetCDF is also a similar way to group all these formats. Uh, ne next slide, Jatama. Thank you. So then uh, also when you have these file formats, then you then you start to think about from an infrastructure perspective, when you have like all these hundreds, hundreds and thousands of processes that are part of your application, uh, how, how does it actually uh, work with data uh, at the bottom? 
So MPI applications, message passing interface is a mechanism to, uh, as you may know, to exchange uh, data between the processes, but uh, MPI IO, for, within MPI is a mechanism to actually do the IO. So where you delegate some processes to actually do the IO for you. And all these processes may be working with a single shared file or big shared file, or they might be working with the uh, uh, individual files on their own, or they might delegate some of these processes to be the leaders and they, they actually send all the IO to them and that delegated leader does the IO. Or you can have groups of these processes, you know, do uh, do uh, do IO to a certain group, certain leaders within, um, you know, de designated leaders. So different ways to do IO uh, when it comes to uh, MPI applications, which are like the mainstay of HPC. So next slide. So uh, so we, 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 we briefly looked at uh, 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 different ways of, uh, so we, we looked at POSIX and some ways to access uh, data. So now let's look at uh, some possible storage trends and uh, possible futures. So as, as we see, NVRAM in the IO stack is the main stage. It's a very big trend. So uh, storage class memories, non-volatile memories uh, in the last five years. So, uh, and then there's, uh, we see uh, the usage of object stores as well. Uh, how how that can be used in uh, HPC. So th that's starting to come uh, more of a, uh, at, at least in a lot of research programs. And in storage computing is also a big trend. So in HPC, just the cost of moving data from storage to compute and back to storage, that's very intensive. And as applications become more and more data intensive, this just the flow of data between storage and compute is going to take a lot of energy. So uh, uh, there's a lot of research on trying to keep data wherever it is and you use uh, processing capabilities that are closely available to the data so that you can just ship the functions or ship the processing closer to storage. Or also quality of service is also uh, also some of the trends that we have seen uh, which, which, which in many of the research programs is how you can control and throttle the available performance for the uh, different storage pools uh, it, it could be you, you could specifically ask for bandwidth or latency and things like that. Uh, so the other trend, uh, I'll tell you about ephemeral storage services in just a bit. And even federation of data stores is a very big trend. Uh, so especially with the initiatives in Europe. So for example, there is a trend initiative in Europe called Gaia X. It's actually a, a way to federate all the uh, cloud service providers and all the all the edge locations and have a big federated uh, uh, federated cloud. And HPC is actually a part of the Gaia X strategy. So when uh, when we go towards these kind of trends, then federation of data stores become more and more important. How you can actually uh, different HPC centers, different sites have different stores. How you can actually group them all together um, with well-defined APIs on top. So uh, that's that's uh, that's an evolving trend. And also understandability of storage systems and uh, uh, leveraging machine learning to have a very deep insight on what's exactly the problem. So that's a, that's an ongoing trend as well. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a bit about the last point. Uh, so, so next slide, please, uh, Yotama. So, uh, so uh, as you see, uh, one of the big trends is that uh, with all these non-volatile memories, uh, so what's happened is that you have non-volatile memory, you have uh, flash SSDs, then you have high-performing uh, disk drives, you have uh, slow-performing archival disk drives, you have tape. So, so many, it's a zoo of different kinds of uh, device types. So the big question is, what's, what are you going to use for your application, for your infrastructure? And the answer to that is all you can mix and match all of them. So because all of these devices di provide you different points in your cost curve, in your performance curve. So uh, you, you can optimize your infrastructure for cost and performance by mixing and matching all these different kinds of devices in some nice smart way. So that's uh, that's one of the <clears throat> that's one of the uh, uh, researches. That's one of some of the research that's already going on in many of the research projects in Europe as well. Uh, and uh, I want to touch upon this trend a little bit. So uh, next slide, please. So uh, hierarchical storage systems, as I was mentioning, I just uh, mentioned to you about 
capacity points uh, and giving you different performance points and uh, and once you have these hierarchical storage systems you can have various kinds of workloads on top of it and you're not constrained by uh, any particular performance that any particular tier offers you because you could use the highest performing tier all the time but then your the cost of your infrastructure is going to blow through the roof so uh, that's going to be an issue so uh, next slide please <clears throat> so as you see, uh, you have, if you look at the caches all the way from the core registers to the HDDs, you see the different L1, L2, L3 caches, then you have the DRAM, and then you have Flash and HDDs providing for your persistent storage. But between the DRAM and Flash is where the storage class memories are now starting to come into the picture. So they provide you different uh, point in your performance, uh, uh, performance uh, map and they provide you a different point in your cost map and they provide you a different point in your capacity map. So uh, it's interesting to see how you can now work with that. So, so next slide, please. So yeah, I'll skip this. I think we mentioned this next slide. Uh, I'll skip this as well. Yeah, so you see a 3D cross point is just an example of storage class memory. So that's uh, widely uh, widely uh, popular now. So it, it's uh, it sits between your SSD and D, uh, DRAM, and we, we have all experimented with the 3D cross point uh, and the performances that 3D cross point can offer. And this is some data that was available from the uh, register on what 3D cross point can offer. So 3D cross point uh, comes in both uh, DIMM form factor, which is uh, or it can be in a PCIe form factor so you can access it as a block device or you can access it as memory so the big question is uh, how exactly are this are this uh, 3d cross point uh, what's the best way to access it whether you you use it as persistent memory or just you use it as a very high performance storage tier this you can actually mix and match and work with all these different kinds of uh, paradigms so uh, so next slide please so uh, yeah, so as you see, this is uh, data. This is a slide from uh, Intel, uh, and uh, obviously uh, uh, you see that 3D cross point offers very very low latency, but it also comes at a cost. Uh, so uh, so you need to see how to work with uh, work with your cost equation. So next slide. So just an example of a hierarchical storage system. So uh, uh, in one of the projects uh, that we are currently part of, uh, it's called uh, Sage. So it's a hierarchical storage system that's deployed at Ulix Supercomputing Center where you have NVRAM and flash and uh, SAS drives and archival drives. They're all working as part of a single storage system driven by an object store and working with different kinds of HPC applications. So next slide, please. <clears throat> So yeah, this is how it uh, looks like. So the green bit is the NVRAM, and then uh, you have a tier two one through two four is the SSDs, and tier three one three two are the higher performing SAS drives. Four one four two are the uh, very lower performing uh, drives. So they are all driven by an object store, and on, on on top. So this is connected to the ULIC uh, uh, network, and you have uh, H, uh, you have applications that are accessing this uh, hierarchical storage, uh, uh, and it's all all uh, accessing objects so there's uh, there's actually no parallel file system here so this was a th this was a very good interesting insight that we obtained from the from the project that uh, actually you can use hierarchical storage systems and object stores <laughs> next slide please so uh, just an example of an object storage system so i'll uh, i'll touch upon uh, motor and also a couple of others but motor is one example of an object store that's used in uh, that's experimented within hpc uh, it's used in uh, as waste 2 project and uh, sage sage 2 project and uh, ioc project and uh, it's in within as waste 2 it's uh, it's the back end for the air systems data middleware and uh, it, it, there's also plans uh, to be deployed in in in, in a site so motor as an object store as you see Fundamentally, you, it can work on different kinds, any tier at the back end, SSDs or uh, and, uh, SDDs, NVRAM, etc. But uh, the beauty of uh, object stores, and for example, just giving an example of motor here, is that you can overlay any kind of gateway on top. It could be POSIX, PNFS, SIFS, 
and you can also have third parties to add in their uh, their uh, third party plugins as well <coughs> so uh, with 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 uh, with an object store you can also have layouts to work with these different tiers and in storage computation and things like that so <coughs> So Motor is fully open source and uh, you, uh, Cortex is part of the Cortex uh, software. So it's uh, it's fully open source by my company, uh, Seagate, and uh, it's Apache version too. So it's extremely flexible. So it's uh, anyone can test drive this one. Next slide, please. So I was talking to you about ephemeral services as a trend. So in one of the projects uh, that uh, that we are part of, uh, along with CE and Ulysses and others, is we uh, we are also experimenting with the idea of data accesses that are spawned on demand. So typically, you have your storage infrastructure as static. Um, however, uh, what we are trying to do is that we have a hierarchical storage system at the the back end, and you can actually spawn all these different data accesses on demand, as needed by the application in this in this in this specialized data nodes. So they provide you like a lot of flexibility. So you can have POSIX and NFS and S3, everything overlaid on top of, for example, we use motor here. Uh, and uh, yeah, the resource manager driving these different data accesses. So this might actually give you some advantages in terms of cost, spawning all these services on demand rather than bolting them on and just uh, not using them when it's not needed. You just spawn it on demand. So next slide, please. So as as uh, also quick point is also uh, tape is also part of the equation now because uh, we are also experimenting as a community uh, to access tapes using object API. So everyone said tape is going to be dead, but that's all that's been going on for the last 40, 30 years. So there's always uh, so which which actually goes back to my belief that there's a place for all these different types of uh, uh, storage persistent storage uh, technologies. So then uh, I'll touch upon Deos and uh, Ceph. So Ceph is heavily used in the cloud community. So you have uh, Redos is the basic infrastructure and LibRedos is the API. And on top of the API, you can have various uh, gateways to work just like S3 and things like that. So Ceph is more of a mainstay in, uh, in the cloud uh, community, but it's also used a little bit in HPC, but Deos is, is probably a bit more interesting for HPC. Very similar structure. If you look, you saw motor where you have basic services, then you have uh, a library, and on top of a library, you have various gateways. Follows a very similar structure and goes back to the fundamental belief is that objects are a uh, very nice way to organize uh, data at a low level. Uh, you, as you see, POSIX, MPIIO, HDFI, they can all be overlaid on top of a library. And DAOS is basically optimized for uh, 3D cross point uh, uh, technology. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so uh, some of the technical challenges uh, with any of these kind of hierarchical storage systems is that you, now you have to deal with different kinds of storage systems. Uh, they all have different fault tolerance characteristics and the infrastructure need to handle software failures and hardware failures. And uh, the, so, it's, it's, uh, uh, so it becomes a very complicated problem. So, which is the reason why telemetry is going to be more and more important. So, how you can actually get telemetry from all your storage infrastructure, how you can analyze it intelligently, how you can predict some of the failures, take actions. Uh, so, the, the good thing is that uh, now with the data analytics, uh, beyond the data analytics uh, phase, now we are in the AI machine learning uh, Phase now, so uh, I think there's a lot of scope for actually doing more smarter storage systems that can self-heal, um, uh, and uh, you can where 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 uh, you can very intelligently make use of all this telemetry. So, so next slide, please. So finally, uh, some of the when you have these hierarchical storage systems, uh, then how the big question is, what do you do? How long do you retain data in each tier when do you migrate data to lower tiers uh, and as i said tape starting to be addressed now whether we need some special uh, policy engines or managers to deal with the data moments so all these are big sort of open questions now uh, and uh, yeah with now with machine learning and things like that i think we can have very smarter policy engines to uh, 
affect all these data movements. So, so yeah, this is some of the uh, trends. So I touched upon data access and object stores, <clears throat> uh, non-volatile memory, hierarchical storage systems, and some of the upcoming trends. Uh, so hopefully this is sort of given you all a feel for what's going on uh, in the research, uh, in, in our community, in the research community, and also in the vendor uh, uh, interest of some of the vendors as well. Uh, and uh, yeah, hopefully it's a nice journey for you to start experimenting with some of these and good luck to you all. And uh, thanks to Julian for giving us the opportunity to uh, present some of this. And uh, thanks to Jean Thomas for moving my slides forward. So thank you so much, Jean Thomas. <laughs> So that's uh, that's it from my side. <clears throat>